Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. That's a. Uh, that's not even the right tune. Is that John Kate Bush? Ma John McCormick. Oh, John McCormick. <laughs> okay, so that shows you how much Darren knows about Irish music. This is the Blarney Pilgrims podcast, episode one, and Darren has just in one tiny phrase encapsulated why we're why we're doing this project, which is that I used to play a bit of music and I stopped for many years and I'm reacquainting myself with it through the medium of the tin whistle. Darren uh, ne never played uh, never played Irish music, plays old time banjo. And I also didn't pay any attention, just like when I was in school. <laughs> I didn't pay any attention to the music that was in abundance around me. And right. years later, now I'm paying the price and putting in the hard yards. So here's where we are. And, and we're talking to musicians uh, who play Irish music mostly, but not exclusively, over the next however many million episodes of this podcast that we're going to do. And we're talking about their first connections with the music, where's the origin of their of their love of this music? And that's that's essentially what we're talking about in these in these podcasts. But we're also talking about other things like playing in sessions and what happens when you're in the middle of a session and you're rattling through tunes and you just get into this headspace where you're kind of gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is you know, it's just something else. You know, it's um, so that's what we're doing. And today, episode one, we're going to start with an interview with. A fantastic guitar player, whistle player, singer, oh, Jerry fella. McKeague. A lovely fellow. Um, so Jerry lives in Geelong. He was born in Belfast. And this was the first interview that myself and Darren recorded. So you'll hear a couple of uh, rough and ready questions from me and Darren. Um, I was strictly producer back then. Dom wouldn't allow me on the microphone until halfway <laughs> through. He changed his mind and thought, you know what? Why don't you hop I on? I could do with a bit of help here. Yeah. So anyway, here it is. Uh, Jerry McKeague with a song called Fisherman's Day. So this is a song written by Brian Connors uh, from Belfast. He was a, a, a father of a good friend of mine, Chris Connors. Uh, Chris and myself went to school together in Belfast. And um, during our teenage years, we, we knocked about a bit together and there would always have been music in, in Chris's house, like there was music in my own house. And uh, Brian um, would often be playing the guitar, singing a song. I'll stroll by the shore on a soft summer's evening Where the sea stirs the sand and the boat homeward steers no more will I follow the call of the ocean For the glen is my home in my last wean of years Farewell to the sea, to the nets, to the fishes no more will I sail far from Cushion Dong Bay For evening is drifting along Ballymen And the night takes the light from the fisherman's day Shadows are steel in the green from the glenside and the salmon are home to the road native streams I'll take a long pint in the heel of the evening where the fish of the past will be part of my dream Farewell to the sea, to the nets, to the fishes. No more will I sail far from Cushion Dong Bay. For evening is drifting along Ballymen, and the night takes the light from the fisherman's day.
And when my day's done and my dreams are forgotten, just lay me down here where the sea meets the bay. And I'll hear winter winds as they roll over Brabla and feel the warm sun on a soft summer's day. Farewell to the sea, to the nets, to the fishes. No more will I sail far from Cushion Dun Bay. For evening is drifting along Ballymen, and the night takes the light from the fisherman's day. And the night takes the light from the fisherman's day. Wow, beautiful. We were kind of in a Glen's mm -hmm. frame of mind now, right? So that's my mother is from Glenchesk. So right. okay. and I grew up in Ballycastle and yeah. so I'm from the Glen's of Antrim and yeah. it's every place in that song I can kind of picture it in my head yeah. so yeah. I'm almost greeting <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so there you go that's uh, that was fantastic thank you so how did you start playing I mean where where in in your kind of childhood where where was the music coming from I was very fortunate that there was music always around my home uh, my parents were were into a lot of folk music like American folk music, Joan Baez. Um, they liked uh, Bob Dylan. They played. They played a lot of music at home. My dad played guitar a lot in the house. Played Irish music a lot in the house. Irish songs. Um, I think one of the first songs I would have heard him sing would have been Sam Hall. Uh, and of course, when you're a kid hearing this song about this man, what's he doing, Daddy? And he's like, Oh, he's he's getting he's getting hanged. It's like. Oh, geez, that's that's a bit rough, you know. But um, and he, he, he hit you one and all when you're a little boy and your dad sing that. It's like, what's going on, dad? Yeah. But uh, that would have been one of the first ones. And then he he actually taught guitar lessons to the kids. My dad my dad was a school teacher, a primary school teacher, so he he had a lot of kids. He'd be teaching guitar to in the house. Uh, so we would hear him singing a lot. He was he was spend lots of time playing the guitar, singing songs, working stuff out. Um, a lot of Irish songs. Uh, he liked he liked the Wolf Tones. He likes the Wolf Tones. Likes the Furies. And and were you automatically sort of drawn towards that, or were you kind of like, no thanks, Dad? I don't. Th I don't even think it was it was as it was as obvious as that. We we just heard it. It wasn't like you know it was it was Dad's music. But um, I was thinking about this again when I knew we were going to be having this chat. We for a number of years we went up to a guest house in Guidor. Um, with the family, extended family, our aunts and uncles and cousins, and everybody went up. So this would have been when I was going through primary school, and um, this was a great guest house. It was uh, Moya McBride ran it, and uh, so there would have been maybe five or six families staying there. Carrick and Chaskin, I think's the name of the place we stayed, and they had they would have had the Anko boys in at that time, and they were the boys on the work experience who would have been coming up. Uh, to the industrial estate in Guidor and Derry Beg, and then she would put them up. So they were in the guest house as well, and they were from all over. There were fellows from Connemara and um, fellows from further down the country. And Moya was just a very hospitable person, and she would often have uh, nights where people would just sing a song or play a bit of music. So when we were there, of course, Dad had cut his guitar with him, and he'd he'd sing a few songs. And then my uncle Jimmy, he's a great guitar player and great singer as well, he would play. And then some of the uncle boys might start singing. And my uncle Seamus, who actually doesn't play an instrument, but he is probably responsible for a lot of us playing the music because he really took it apart. He really pushed us. You know, he would encourage us all the time and does encourage still the family, the young ones, to play and sing. And um, we would have picked up, when we were staying down there, we'd pick up 
the Sudalums books of songs. I remember the, the Sudalums Irish ballads. I do remember those. Yeah, remember yeah, those? yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I probably still have a couple like some of them. Yeah. So I uh, uh, can be a bit obsessive about things, and I I remember getting a couple of those books and just learning those <laughs> Lola songs by rote the words, trying to get all the verses right, you know, and then trying to get them ready for the night when we'd sing at, at the guest house and. Um, and no no doubt like there were times when you didn't want to sing and daddy would say you know get up and give us a song and you didn't want to do it um, but we would still learn the songs and, and so so this would be like you your dad and your mum and your uh, brothers and sisters brothers and, and sisters yeah my brother how many how many is in the family there's six I'm the eldest of six so back then there would have been probably only three of us because the other three came later so uh, and bridging at that stage would have been she would have been a baby so it would have been Rory and myself and her cousin Shane and Amory um, and James and Sarah Fiona McLaren so, they, 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 so they. What, what age would you be then? Those kind of... I would have been between probably 9 and 11 or 12 and, and when you think about that now is it is it uh, I mean you, you seem to look on it pretty fondly oh, right? yeah. So. oh yeah it was a great time it was a great time and um it was a time when uh, I learnt a lot of songs that I still sing sometimes, you know. Got those by the root learning, got the got the got all those verses in. And I remember those books were great because they had little photographs on the side. Um, you know, so there'd be, there'd be some photographs that they would have, I don't know where they would have got them from, the National Library or something, but they'd have like, you know, a man in the 1880s mending a shoe or something. or uh, And then we had... You know the rebels' songs as well. I had, we're trying to learn all those, and then you'd cross the border, and um, there was one one time. A Bridgie must have only been two or three, and she heard she heard all this, and we were coming across the border, and there was a checkpoint on the Craigavon Bridge or something. And I remember, and uh, we we're trying to. Show, Bridgie started singing Sean South from Gary Owen, the top of her lungs in the back seat that she'd heard us all singing. <laughs> and we were we were trying to shut her up as we were coming up to the the the. Uh, the police check checkpoint. You know, we're back, obviously back back in the north then. Right. Uh, uh, but yeah, look, we we I I learned learned lots of lots of songs up there, and that was really important for me learning stuff. I think. So, so I want to talk a bit more about that um, notion, particularly in the context of where you were growing up and where I was growing up. The the idea of um, quote unquote Irish music as being a kind of badge of identity, and you know, there's a whole kind of political background going on there, and um, but. Let's do another song first. What's uh, sure. what's the next song you fancy singing? Um, the next song I'll do is uh, "Sleep Gallon Brays," um, which I heard my my dad's grandfather sing, John McAllister. So he died uh, nineteen eighty nine, the ripe old age of ninety seven, and he would have often been at family gatherings on my dad's side, up in Draperstown, um, Balna Green, or Port Stewart where my granny uh, lived, Granny Margaret, his daughter. So uh, John sang this song and he had a number of verses that we don't have anymore. So I'm not sure. I think he had about 15 verses in this song at one point. And I believe he was interviewed by the BBC in the late 60s, early 70s. And there's a recording somewhere, I believe, of him being interviewed, but we've, never, we've not been able to find it. So uh, I'll, I'll try and sing this song. Um, uh, sleeve sleeve gallon is about a emigrant. As I went out a walking all in the month of May to view yon fair valleys and your mountains so gay, I was thinking of the flowers. All a doom to decay That bloom around you Bonnie, bonnie Sleep gallon braes My name is young McGarvey As you might understand I come from Derry, Kennet, and I own a farm of land. But the rents are getting higher, and I can no longer stay. 
So farewell unto you, bonny, bonny, sleep, gallant, brace. And oft times I did wander with my dog and my gun to view yon fair valleys all for joy and for fun. But the days they are long over, and I am far away. So farewell unto you, bonny, bonny, sleep, gallant, brace. It's oft times I did wonder when the sun was in the west. To view yon fair valleys with the girl I love the best. But the days of youth have vanished, and I am far away. So farewell unto you, bonny, bonny, sleep, gallant, brace. Farewell to old Ireland, that island so green, to that little church at Lesson and the town of Balness Green. May good fortune shine upon you while I am far away. So farewell unto you, bonny, bonny, sleep, gallant, brace. It was not for the want of employment alone that caused all the sons of old Ireland to roam, but it was the cruel landlords that would not let us stay. So farewell unto you, bonny, bonny, sleep, gallant, praise. I want to pick up just on what we were talking about there. Um, you sort of hinted at it coming over the border from... Donegal back to the north and um, when I was growing up a wee bit before you probably in, in the in the 80s the early 70s and in the 80s um, there was definitely a sense that this music was a badge of identity and it identified you culturally and it identified you politically I guess you know so so how was that you know as you're sort of 17 18 you know, and you're coming into sort of political consciousness as well. You're living in Belfast. How are these things weaving together for you? I mean, are you comfortable with it? Are you what? What's Belfast like for you? What's I mean, I'm throwing a lot in here, but I'm just I'm curious about how these all sort of interact. You know? Yeah. So when when I was uh, when I was going through those teenage years, I I still we still had the family gatherings and we'd we'd sing sing the songs and that you know. But I was really going in another direction. Like I was. I was really into um, different types of music at school. I was playing in bands with my mates, and we were doing, you know, punk punk rock bands. We were into Stiff Little Fingers, and then we were into, um, you know, bands like uh, Nirvana and that stuff. You know, I was playing in a grunge band back in Belfast at the end of my school year, and um, that's the kind of music I was into, like Sonic Youth, Fugazi, The Pixies, um, Stone Roses, uh, you know, they were bands that I was listening to. I wasn't really listening to Irish music during those years, really. Mm -hmm. um, but then if we had the family gatherings with uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, then we'd still be playing the songs that we would have um, played played and sung before. So, yeah, we had we had a had a, a sense of nationalist identity with uh, with the songs and the music. 
but it would have been, you know, Republican with a small R, I would say, the best way to put it, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of cliched term. But, um, you know, it, it, we, were, we weren't, uh, we certainly weren't uh, blind to what was going on around us, but some of the stuff that was happening in Belfast, during, particularly during the 1980s, you know, horrific things were happening all, all around to all, all groups of people in all communities. And it was just, you were just in the middle of it. You didn't have time to really analyze it and think really what, what side I'm on here because you were just a kid growing up. Um, and I just remember, you know, there were a couple of events because dad really didn't talk to us about politics at home. He didn't, he never really talked about anything like that within the home. Um, and it was, you know, particularly that, that week in 1980s after um, the Gibraltar shootings and those events that happened that's the time that I really remember uh, the only time whenever dad was just watching the TV and said no maybe we shouldn't be here you know maybe we should move and that's the only time he ever really said that that I can remember to us but that was a very dark time uh, for everybody so then you know you're you listen to all this non-folk stuff yeah. is there a a period where you start to be drawn back towards that aside from the house things like like would you start to think about playing it again or uh that i was in bands really until 94 93 94 95 and would you be going to sessions in belfast as well like no not back not not in the early 90s i was going to gigs At that stage belfast was really just a really very lively place there were bands like ash and therapy were taken off and they were playing gigs and we'd, we'd get on the bill with, you know, 10 other bands. Um, you know, it was great fun. Uh, and were you at so. uni about this time then? Yeah, I was at university. I, I failed my first year because of it, because I didn't do any study. First year in medicine and I didn't spend much time learning my anatomy. So uh, I failed the, failed the year and had to sit it again and that sort of focused me and it was like, she's right. I'll, uh, uh, so I actually, I, I think I gave up the band then actually for a while. Um, and the fellows went on without me to much, much better things without me playing with them. Uh, and then uh, while I was at uni, I went down to Galway with a few mates. We went down to do our electives down there where you go down to a hospital and you're attached there for for a, a month or two. So um, turned up at the at the hospital in Galway and we were given our accommodation out in the horse boxes out in the back. And uh the doctors were like, oh, we will not be seeing you for two months now, so you're, you can just go off and do what you just want. <laughs> so, we, so we just had a great time. We went out and uh, saw the sites of Galway and spent, spent all, all our funds. And um, then while we were there, I, I called into a few pubs down there, Taft's and um, the Korean, and uh, heard the sessions happening. And So I just brought my guitar along, like lots of us do. And to be fair, when you don't know anything about the music and your guitar player, you just bring your guitar along because you think, well, I'll just have a crack here, you know. And I was just completely messing up their session. I'm, I'm quite sure, thinking back now. Um, but there was one of the fellows beside me in Taft's bar back in, this would be like 92, 93. And I was just, I was sitting beside him and I was, I think I actually said to him, you know, it's great. It's great the music here you have, but we don't have anything like this up in Belfast, I said to him. And he just, he actually stopped playing. I think he was, he was a Boron player. I won't hold that against him. And he turned around to me and he said, he said, some of the finest players in the country are from Belfast. You obviously don't know your arse from your elbow. <laughs> I was like, like, oh, and of course, now I think back to it, you know, he was, he was dead right. And, you know, and that, that was, that was the kick up the arse that I needed. I just thought I could swan in and, you know, I had my, my own pedigree of guitar playing. I was like, oh, this is no bother. I'll just come in and he was like, mate, you know, and he actually said to me, he said, uh, you know, if you don't know the tunes, don't play. So, um, I just loved it. I really got such a buzz out of it. And then when I came back to Belfast, I looked up to where the sessions were and went down to Tom Kelly's bar down in the Liverpool bar, which was a great venue for sessions sadly it's not there anymore just opposite where the Seacat terminal was and that was just a, it was a brilliant venue Wednesday nights and Sunday nights and um, you'd go in and then don't know who you'd be playing with or who'd be coming in to play or sing a song or then Tom would sing at the end of the night and oh, it was just a fantastic venue really right. and and it was it was a mixed clientele you know you'd be playing with fellas who from a different background yourself and who, who find the music themselves as well and it was great, and actually, religion was never mentioned in, in those those nights, uh, and that would have been still the, 
early to mid 90s, you know, um, but I loved that. So that's really where I just I tried to go down every week and listen to what was being played and try and work out chords for it and learn the tunes in a way that I could I could back them. Mm-hmm. People like Paul McSherry and Owen O'Brien were big influences on me here and there. And, and what were you picking up from them in terms of style? Like, was it was it about tuning? Was it about rhythm? Oh, yeah, it was, uh, it was dad guy tuning that the, the, the fellas were playing and the rhythms that they were using to back the music um, and the chords they were using. I just it just blew me away. I just thought it was the best thing I'd ever heard. And of course, when you when you see something like that, that you know. Most of us, I think, when you see something that really appeals to you, you wanna you wanna know how people do it, whether it's writing or art or music. It's like when you see something that really touches you, it's like I want to do that as well. You know, how do you do that? Can you show us how you do it? And Paul McSherry was was a great great teacher. I I just asked him one day, and he said, "Yeah, come along." And so Paul, I spent several weeks with Paul, just picking his brains and how are you doing this. And he was he was great. He was very generous and taught me lots of chord structures and taught me about the rhythm and. I learned a lot of music from him, a lot of guitar uh, technique from from Paul. Is there something? Do you have anything to hand that that makes you think of Paul? If we wanted to talk about that, is there anything that springs to mind? Or I'm, um, I'm sort of springing that on you, but uh, well, he he taught me a few Breton tunes, but I don't know if I could remember them now. Um, there's there's a tune. Uh, what did I do with him? There's one. Uh, we did uh, Pierre Ben Susan, uh, Voice to Ireland. That tune, I think I remember doing that with him. Don't know if I can, if I, if I, if I make a hymns of it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to. Too shabby. <laughs> Thank you. Just uh, get my fingers around that. It's a bit tricky, now. Yeah, 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 that's pretty good, though. Yeah. So, so do you want to do another song then? Let's uh, let's do uh, let's do another song. Yeah. So this is a, a song called "Shipyard Slips" about the man who worked um, uh, the island man who worked in the shipyard in Belfast, and it's a song about one of them leaving. Uh, written by one of the the uh, great bands that come out of Belfast, uh, The Men of No Property, uh, and Brian Moore, and uh, um, I think it's it's down as uh, David Dave Scott, I think, uh, credited with this song, but I think that's a, it's, it's a, um, a pseudonym for maybe Brian, possibly, I'm not sure. So... Um. <laughs> Thank you. 
from Belfast town I'm on me way on a ship that was built for the tourist trade And I'm leaving behind the land where I was born And I'll not return till my fortune is made For I've served my time with the island men And I've known good times and work aplenty but there's no work now in these troubled times And the shipyard slips lying empty Oh then farewell my father and my mother dear Old age has laid its hand upon you And you've loved me well and you've never failed And it's leaving your side my heart it will rue Oh, I promise to write when I settle down for to ease your mind For I know that you'll worry But just think of the hour when I return But don't count the months or the time, it won't hurry For I've served my time with the island men And I've known good times and work aplenty but there's no work now in these troubled times And the shipyard slips a lying empty I remember the hills and the fresh north air I remember the girls with their friendly smiles And I think of my friends whom I love dear And I hope my love it transcends the miles and I'm going away to look for work But I'll wait for the time of my returning To a job, a home and some peace of mind For those Belfast people I'll always be yearning For I've served my time with the island men And I've known good times and work aplenty but there's no work now in these troubled times And the shipyard slips a lying empty For I've served my time with the island men And I've known good times and work aplenty But there's no work now in these troubled times And the shipyard slips a lying empty Shipyard Slips, performed by Jerry McKeague. Jerry, so, you know, we're two um, Antrim men, and Darren here, the producer, is from Drogheda. Well, I guess, yeah. So you live in Geelong. You've moved here four years ago after a stint back in Ireland, and I find myself kind of drawn to, towards this, these kinds of songs and these kinds of, this kinds of music, in part because of the absence from where you grew up, right? Mm -hmm. So, are you getting solace from playing? Like, why do you, why do you sing a song like that? For yeah, instance, yeah, right? um, yeah. I, I remember Billy Connolly talking about that once about uh, you know Scottish folk singers singing about being miles away from Scotland when they're frigging in Scotland. Like, what is that? <laughs> so that's the thing, I would have sung them back in Ireland anyway. You know, these were songs that I was singing. Maybe not The Shipyard Slips, I've learned that since I've, I've come out here. Um, but all those other songs, they were just part of the kind of the, the canon, the stuff that people sang, weren't they? Like, you know, mm -hmm. songs about being away from home, even when you were at home singing them. <laughs> but uh, obviously... Songs about wanting to get away. <laughs> songs about wanting to escape. Um, but you know, obviously, there's 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 a deeper. I'm being facetious. There's a deeper issue there. I'm sure amongst lots of people with families, family members who aren't there, singing. You know, and people thinking about their relatives who are away as well. Um, I mean, for you, so, right? Do you feel fairly, I don't know, rooted here? Do you feel fairly committed to staying here in in Geelong or in Victoria in Australia? I th I think we I think yes, we are pretty much rooted here, and I feel. I, I personally just feel like I've got two homes really between here and, and Belfast um, and I've been lucky enough to get back 
the last few years I've been I've been back a couple of times to see the family and it's great to just um, catch up with everybody again and see the see the family and catch up with friends and you know walk walk around Belfast and and really feel it getting into your bones again is great I love it uh, and then I love coming back here now as well and I feel that Geelong's our home and it's been very good to us since we've come here we've we've um, we've really found found the people here to be wonderful very welcoming. So you're not sitting in the dark at night drinking porter and <laughs> and weeping. Not at all. Not at all. No. Although I have to say, whenever uh, uh, I was lucky enough to get get a gig at the National Celtic Festival a couple of years ago, and I was um, practicing for you know a couple of months before that festival, and I was going over these songs, you know, again and again and again and again and again, and then I had that festival experience and then I came away from that festival and I really felt quite emotionally upset you know I felt and I don't know whether it was just the mantra of singing these songs and you know singing them on stage um, and learning them and again and going back into them but it kind of upset me after the festival and plus you know we spent a fe- uh, weekend hanging out with uh, musicians and, and Irish guys who were who'd come over from Ireland and a few Belfast fellas were there that year as well and I really felt when they left it was like geez right you know they've gone back to Ireland where I'm from and I'm still here and singing these songs you know and it was a bit it was just a bit of a, a wobble for me personally for a few weeks but then it was fine you know and you, uh, as as I'm sure you know yourself everybody has a wobble occasionally and the thing is you have you usually have the wobble at a different time to other people in your family who are having wobbles <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> so hopefully, because you know, if you all have a wobble at the same time, you probably pack your bags and go. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, so, uh, so avoid yes. avoid precipitous decisions when when everybody's having the wobble at the same time. Absolutely, right. absolutely, because it does pass. Um, and of course, we're and we're migrants by well, personally speaking, I'm a migrant by choice. It's a, I mean, that's, that's the choice. other thing of it. it. Like we have the luxury of we choice. Have the luxury. We, have the we have the luxury, luxury of, of staying. We have the luxury yeah. of going. Uh-huh. You know, yeah, so I feel like, you know, to come over here and then whinge about being here, it's like, well, mate, you actually, you're the one that paid for the ticket to come here. You know, you've, you've got everybody on the plane. Like, you know, it's like that joke about he makes his own sandwiches. And like, <laughs> it's just like, well, actually, I'm, I've created this for myself. <laughs> so and I'm, I'm very happy that, that, that we have created this. You know, we've, we're, we're really, thank God, we're having a, a good life here. We've got enough time for each other. So, so be, before we do one more song, uh, um, I want to ask you just about, before you made that commitment about three or four years ago, was there a mo- you were living back in Ireland? Was there mm-hmm. was there a moment where you sort of realised? Did you have a collective wobble that that kind of propelled you from from Ireland back to here? Well, I've I've been trying to get back to Australia from like two thousand and five since I left here. <laughs> I was Tracy wasn't so keen. She was like, "Look, we've, we're back in Ireland now. Will you shut up about Australia? I don't want to hear about it anymore." Uh, and then <laughs> and we, it was fair enough, you know. I was going, I was going on and on about it for a, a long time, um, and then we bought a house in Belfast, and then we got our jobs, and we got entrenched in the infrastructure of Belfast again. And, and you're, you're both doctors, right? Yeah, yeah, we're both we're both GPs, and uh, we were trying to have our cake and eat it. We're trying to be in Belfast, be with the family, and have time with our kids, and be able to do the things that we wanted to do with the family, with the kids, and we just couldn't get all those things to work. They just we just couldn't get them to all measure up they just it just wouldn't happen so we were working a lot we bought the house so we had to work weekends to pay for the house you know and and etc and we were not i mean it's not a sob story there were people in a lot worse off and are in a lot worse off situations than us but we had we felt like we had the the option at that stage well will we go now or not you know um and we decided to go and people have said afterwards, oh, you were very courageous doing that. And it really, I don't think it's about courage, really. I think it is just, it, there is something inside you. It's like a, uh, there is something that's like a force that's just driving you forward. And I knew that that's what we had to do. You know, we just, uh, and I just had it, felt it in my bones. There's no other way to describe it, that once we got here, that it would be okay. Um, and it has been, really, you know. Uh, so, uh, one more song, one more you song, reckon? Yeah, one more song. Um, this is... Uh, a Belfast song that I've only really started singing the last year and it uh, I believe it uh, came originally from that great Belfast song collector Morris Layden who's collected lots of great Belfast street ballads and songs from further afield and uh, it was recorded by Andy Irvine in um, 
and his band Patrick Street, one of his albums. Uh, it's called The Pride of the Springfield Road. I met my lover at walking in the merry month of May. The little birds were singing and the lambs did sport and play. She told me that she loved me and to me she would prove true. If you will stay with me, my lover, then I will stay with you. Oh, we walked along the dam. The birds sang loud and gay. It was there I met me bonny wee lass and she stole me heart away. Her cheeks they are like roses, red and her skin is white as snow. She is the darling of me heart, the pride of the Springfield Road. She says we will get married and may love his name the day And happy we will be together as we go on our way We'll have a charming little house and a garden for to till We'll bring the children up like us to work in the cotton mill And we walked along the dam and the birds sang loud and gay Cause there I met me bonnie Burnett and she stole me heart away Her cheeks they are like roses red and her skin is white as snow She is the darling of me heart, the pride of the Springfield Road I'll bid you all the Jew and to her parents I must go To see if they will have me now or if the answer's no She says they'll treat me kindly and my glass will surely fill We'll drink the health of the bride and groom that work in the cotton mill And we walked along the dam and the birds sang loud and gay It was there I met me Bonnie Burnett and she stole me heart away Her cheeks they are like roses red and her skin is white as snow She is the darling of me heart, the pride of the Springfield Road I met my lover out walking in the merry month of May The little birds were singing and the lambs did sport and play She told me that she loved me and to me she would prove true If you will stay with me, my lover, then I will stay with you And we walked along the dam and the birds sang loud and gay It was there I met me Bonnie Burnett and she stole me heart away Her cheeks they were like roses red and her skin as white as snow She is the darling of me heart, the pride of the Springfield Road She is the darling of me heart, the pride of the Springfield Road Road. She is the darling of me heart, the pride of the Springfield Road. All right, I'm going to go out on a limb there and say that is a lot preferable to the Patrick Street version. <laughs> well, don't be saying that. No, it's fantastic. That's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. So, Darren, I wanted to see... Um, since we were talking about kind of this connection to music and Irish music and you had no connection to Irish music when you were growing up, I was wondering if you wanted to come over and... Well, both of you were saying about singing these songs about lamenting Ireland while being in Ireland. Coming back full circle on that, do you find in those times when you're having a bit of a wobble, does the music, does it help or does it, does it, does it almost make it worse having the, the connection with music like that? So when you sing a song that really reminds you of home, right? You, so it's 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 a pull and a push at the same time. It's the thing that's making you yearn, but it's also the security blanket that yeah. connects you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I would say like when I knew that we were doing this um, podcast, you know, this is the first time I've had the guitar out in a wee while singing songs because there are, you know, I I wouldn't sit and sing those songs at home all the time, but of course when I'm when I've been preparing them for the podcast, it's been great. It's been fantastic to get back into them again and really enjoy them again. Um, but it's like uh, it's a bit like, and that's this is a whole other thing. You could go on talking about this all night, but the 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 photos that the, of the kids when they were kids in Ireland, you know, so kids should be able to look at photographs of of their childhood, you know. But in our family, if we get out the photographs of them as babies or whatever it really it's just too much for them at this stage because they're still young and they're they're trying to deal with this that oh that, that's that's us back there and it just brings it all up for them so it's a little i guess it's a little bit the same with the songs the real the really important songs those touchstone songs that really connect with your family 
you love singing them at events or you know if you were doing gigs you'd you'd, you'd get them ready but they'd be some of them would be too close to home to be singing regularly and you wouldn't you just wouldn't do it you know unless you really you wanted for, for some reason to connect with a person and you, you know you wanted to get back in and sing it which you could do um, but that's that, that, the fact that you can draw on a song right to connect with with friends who are absent mm -hmm. and to connect with that feeling of love for those people right that that kind of blows my mind i mean that's what this podcast is about really was about the, the kind of mystery of that right mm -hmm. did having the ability and the knowledge of the music did it make it easier to fit into Geelong life? Well, I, I would say the music has really helped me to get uh, connected to trad music. I mean, the, the fact that I, that there was a network network of Irish musicians, Irish traditional musicians, Australian Irish traditional musicians, a lot of them, um, who are just great people, great musicians, and I was able to thankfully get... Uh, get to meet those guys early on when I came here in 98, 99 and played sessions with them in Melbourne and then I've stayed friends with them since um, and that's been a great thing for me socially just to, you know, we, we don't catch up that frequently but, you know, when we go to festivals you'll catch up and just slot back into it again you'll have a tune and a beer and, and that's brilliant that's been a really rich part of life here that the music has undoubtedly if, without the music I wouldn't have any of that really and then wouldn't be able to take the kids or you know Tracy and myself going to those festivals just wouldn't wouldn't mean that's 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 a huge part of our life here really even though it's only a few handful of times a year that you go to the festivals but it's a real connection that you have when you go back each year and you see meet families again and uh, forge friendships and uh, and there's nothing like it really sitting around just chatting and sh sharing music with people it's like it's we're so fortunate to be able to do it really it's a very deep way of communicating without having to keep talking all the time you know and you, you were talking about the old the old timey music uh, i mean they seem it's the same and there's there are so many irish musicians australian irish musicians i should say who play old timey music as well and it's like great crossover mm. and i think i suppose coming coming to it from a so i'm new to playing an instrument and then so off the back of that i'm new to this and networking or just network that you plug into yeah. that's a trip right that is something that I'd, I'd no idea that would be probably 50 percent of what the music is you you play for yourself and then you play for this imaginary session in your head and you play at a session and it's just this it, you, you're on the money when you call it another language and that's what i get out of it anyway yeah um, i have to i have to mention my aunt bernadette my dad's aunt bernadette actually was pivotal in our family so she was the daughter of John McAllister, the man who sang Sleep Gallant Brace. Um, Bernadette is uh, is a fantastic woman. She's a, a, she taught music around Portland own Claddy for for years and years and played in Killy bands and uh, I think she won the All Ireland Slow Air competition. And she play? She plays fiddle. And she is just a great person in our family. If there's a family gatherings, she will doesn't matter that you've just started playing old timey music. You'll just be just be like, okay, you're next. Get your get your chin ready. You're gonna and, and the thing is, you, you, there's no room for any ego because the minute you get you get your first song done and then you're on to the next one, she's like, no, Jerry, that's enough from you. We'll just hear now. Uh, Dominic's gonna give us. A, what have you got, Dominic? Dominic's got the song ready. Okay, and then uh, Darren, while Dominic's, it, you just get yourself ready there because you'll be next. It'll go on, and people are absolutely bricking it like they're in. <laughs> people come into the house, and they're like, shit, yeah, I gotta get. It. <laughs> heading for the door <laughs> what are we going to have to do you have to play or sing or do something or do sing a poem or say a poem or something but she's just she's such a marvellous woman for just getting everybody involved and getting them playing something so so we're going to finish up with another song but, uh, do you have any, any gigs coming up or uh, nothing at the moment my sister Mary's over at the moment she's um, she's a, a, a fantastic harper and she's over uh, working uh, in Melbourne. She's here with her boyfriend, Zach, for another year. So hopefully we'll try and get out and maybe play a few gigs. And in the meantime, if anybody wants to, to yeah, find you, just, you. If you. Just find me through Facebook, Jerry McCaig. Happy to uh, connect with you through Facebook if you if you want to drop us a line. Yep. Yeah. On. This, uh, this is a song called uh, The Boston Burglar in Boston City. Um, uh, first appeared in the broadsheets I think around 1889 and went between America and uh, Ireland uh, to and fro and I think it actually originally came out of a, an Australian song Botany Bay I think 
uh, in terms of the structure of it, but um, this is one that was sung in our family and is sung in our family quite a bit. I was born in Boston City, boys, a place you all know well. Brought up by honest parents, the truth to you I'll tell. Brought up by honest parents and raised most tenderly, till I became a sporting lad. At the age of twenty-three My character was taken And I was sent to jail My parents, they tried to bail me out But they found it all in vain The jury found me guilty And the clerk he wrote it down The judge he passed his sentence I was bound for Charles Town I see my aged father And he's standing at the bar Likewise my darling mother And she tearing out her hair the tearing of her old grey locks And the tears came rolling down Saint Johnny, my son, what have you done That you're bound for Charles Town? There's a girl in Boston City, boys A place you all know well and if I had my liberty, it is with her I dwell. Oh, if ever I had my liberty, bad company I would shun. The robbing of the monster bank and the drinking of the rum. All you boys that have your liberty, enjoy it while you can. Don't roam the streets by night or day, making laws of God and man. For if you do, you surely ruin, find yourself like me. Spending out your 21 years, in the Royal Artillery They found me on an eastbound train One dark December day And every station we passed through You could hear the people say There goes the Boston burglar in cold chains he is bound For one crime or another He is bound for Charles Town I was born in Boston City, boys A place you all know well Brought up by honest parents Truth to you I'll tell Brought up by honest parents And raised most tenderly Till I became a sporting lad At the age of twenty-three What a bloody lovely fella <laughs> he is, he, isn't he? No, He's he, just you one know, of the nicest fellas going. And it's funny when you, um, when we've been going around telling people we're doing this podcast, 
everybody to a person said, oh, have you spoken to Jerry McKeague? Yeah. Jerry McKeague, you know. So yeah. there you go. We've spoken and to Jerry McKeague. We spoke for so much longer after that. We stopped the tape rolling and he is just one of the most fascinating guys. And he's been a great supporter of us from the beginning. He's, he's He latched onto this idea. He saw the potential and he's been a fantastic help getting us in front of some of the great players around the area. And look, speaking of support, the one thing you can do to help us at the minute is go on iTunes podcast, go to Blarney Pilgrims, and give us a five star review, even if you think it was a three star. Even episode. if you think one star is a stretch, <laughs> please give us the five because this is why it's boring. But the algorithms that work in the background—if you're getting a lot of five stars with actual reviews, even if it's a one word, awesome. What will happen then is the algorithm will just rise us to the top. That would yeah. Be even amazing. if you don't like us. Like leave it for Jerry McKee because <laughs> he because he was great even exactly. if we were rubbish. Yeah. So anyway, brilliant. But yeah, that's it. Um, we're on social. All the links to everything that we might have mentioned, our socials, Jerry's, will all be in the um, the show notes. So yeah, look forward to hearing from you mm -hmm. next time. Thanks again to Jerry McKee. That was fantastic. Thank you. All right. Hi, my name is Rosa. I'm gonna eat um an apple. Get, give Dominic and Darwin five stars. Thank you.